Okay, I'm here with Neil Hurley today. Uh, Neil is a retired Coast Guard member, uh, an author of, of how many books now? Several. <laughs> Several books, okay. And a lighthouse preservationist. Uh, I would consider part of the second wave of lighthouse preservationists and one of the people who fortunately is still with us and actively working to preserve Florida lighthouses. And today we are going to talk about the attack on Cape Florida. But before we get to that, we want to talk a little bit about the events that led up to it, because people, most people don't even know about the attack on Cape Florida Lighthouse. So when I talk to them about it, they're surprised that it even happened. But it's not just a singular event. There was some things that led up into it that, again, most people don't even know about. So I'd like to shed some light on that. And honestly, I thought I was the only person who had any interest in this story until I met you and you had facts and things that I'd never heard of. So I really want to pick your brain today. So thank you very much for joining me. You're welcome. I, I feel you are a kindred spirit. <laughs> Feels that way. Okay, so let's go back to what started this beforehand. So it wasn't just a bunch of natives that decided to attack a lighthouse. There were things that were going on in the area beforehand. Where do you think we should start? The Florida Seminole Indian Wars were a follow on to the um, Red Stick War. So the Southeast has had a lot of uh, Indian conflict over time. Mm -hmm. um, and if you read the accounts uh, that I've come across, um, they may be interrelated. Um, I think I, we talked before that um, the story of the attack on Cape Florida Lighthouse is best known from an account by the lighthouse keeper who was a temporarily assigned there, John W.B. Thompson. Uh, that was written a few weeks after the attack while he was recuperating from wounds suffered during the attack in Charleston. Um, so the attack was fresh in his mind. So um, in Thompson's second account, he links the attack back to uh, the cause of the attack, uh, back to the Cooley Massacre, mm -hmm. uh, which happened in January 6th, 1836. Uh, which in fact was after the Dade Massacre north of Tampa, which was in December of 1835, which is really seen as the start of Second Seminole Indian War. Thompson said that a man named Lumpkin had been involved uh, in, had lived around the Cooley Plantation, which was up by Fort Lauderdale. Um, and according to this account, uh, an old chief named Alabama insulted Lumpkin's wife. Lumpkin was a poor man um, and he took umbrage to that and he killed Alabama um, and then put his body under some rails and burned it. Mm -hmm. Not Lumpkin, but Lumlin, according to Thompson, was arrested and taken to Key West um, where eventually he was supposed to be tried for the murder. Um, but no one came forward as witnesses. So he was eventually released. And apparently the local Seminoles felt, at least according to Thompson, um, that Cooley could have testified, he was the local justice of the peace for the area, mm -hmm. that he could have testified and resulted in Lumlin uh, being arrested and, and uh, prosecuted for this. And so that's why they were out to get Cooley. When they attacked his plantation, Cooley wasn't there. Um, he was out on the coast trying to uh, salvage some stuff from the wreck of the ship Gil Blast, which uh, wrecked very close to Hillsborough Inlet. His family was killed, uh, his wife and two, two children. Um, uh, one of their tutors and a couple of other folks were killed there. And all of the people from that area came down to Cape Florida and took refuge at the lighthouse. There was about 60 people um, in several different families before they eventually left with uh, DuBose, the current keeper, to go down to Key West. Um, after that, the lighthouse was fortified. Uh, there were small groups of soldiers, like four or five, um, which kind of surprised me, that um, helped to barricade the base of the lighthouse. Uh, Thompson mentions this in his, his newer account. Um, he was, a, according to this account, he was aware of Indians being in the area. Uh, they had moved from the dwelling into the base of the lighthouse for more security. Um, and so he was well aware and expecting an attack. He was hoping for more guards to be sent to him. Uh, he was being paid extra because of the Indian threat for the area. So there were a number of events that were leading up to um, the assaults on the lighthouse.
I was actually planning on going to St. Louis to go get a bunch of personnel records. And those were two of them that I wanted to pull. But then it was April 2020. And then, of course, everything shut down. So my trip there got canceled. So I never got to go. So I'm still planning on trying to do that. But I've been trying to figure out who these two people were because uh, DuBose has got kind of a, a checkered record from what I've seen that he'd hired other local people to watch the lighthouse and he would be away for a while, like uh, in visiting family friends up in the my, what's now Miami area. So he was known to shirk his duties. He'd also send his family down to Key West earlier because of all the, the native uprisings and he wanted them to be safe. And then he took off, you know, because it was his birthday, he wanted to go visit them, but knowing full well, you know, everything that's been going on there, he wanted to get out of there. So I want to find out more about him. Also, Thompson, um, I, I kind of know uh, Craig Anderson, who runs Lighthouse Friends website, and we work together with the U.S. Lighthouse Society. And on his page, he doesn't list Thompson as an official assistant. So I wanted to find out if you knew if he was an actual assistant or if he was just a local that DuBose hired, like he did with the other people, to, to you know, take over there while he took off and kind of you know, skirted the whole issue. So I was one of the early folks writing negative things about John DuBose. <laughs> um, in fact, uh, I think one of the first things I ever published was an article in the Keeper's Log about less than notable lighthouse keepers. And, and DuBose was there because um, he had, there were claims again, he, he was in a feud with the collector of customs and superintendent of lighthouses in Key West right. uh, for much of his, his career. But one of the allegations was that he was living on the mainland about eight miles from the lighthouse uh, where he did have a homestead. I'm, I'm not exactly sure where it was, but he had some gardens and, and other things there while he had an elderly um, black slave who maintained lighthouse. Um, and so he may have gone back and forth, but it, it did look like he had other folks maintaining it. Mm -hmm. um, after I wrote that, Joan Gill Blank, who wrote a very good book on Key Biscayne, um, came out with her book, and she had researched DuBose, who eventually went to Texas and settled in southern Texas. Um, and she found a drawing of, of what he looked like um, and uh, had several other things. And, and her opinion was that um, he was a very dedicated man. Um, who just saw the writing on the wall that the Indians are attacking, and I'm not going to stay around here and have my family killed. Um, so DuBose was absent at the time of the attack. Um, according to Thompson's second account, he had been at the lighthouse for several months, um, and he was hired to work there for $1,000 a year, which uh, was way more Enormous. than a then DuBose was paid. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, I think the president only received like $3,000 a year or so. And that was the highest paid government uh, salary. Um, I haven't found any evidence that shows that he was paid that amount, but it, um, and whether he had a longstanding contract or that was one of the things that he was embellishing a little bit, but it makes sense that um, he was paid more um, he may have been expected to have additional guards there. Um, reading the account again, I'm pretty convinced that uh, Aaron Carter was his slave. He called Thompson master. Um, he was an elderly black man. There weren't that many free uh, African-Americans in South Florida at the time. Uh, 1937. Um, so that may have been part of the deal is have a couple people there. And, and then I think he was promised more guards. Um, there is some record of Whitehead having to go back to ask for some additional money that he spent in providing guards for the lighthouse. Um, and he wrote those letters to the secret, uh, the fifth auditor of the treasury. So there's, there's some records of that. Okay. Can um, you, can you quickly say who, uh, well, William Whitehead was? William Whitehead was the um, collector of customs and superintendent of lighthouses in Key West who had responsibility for all the lighthouses in South Florida as, as few as there or only a few. Um, <clears throat> I did recently come across a copy of a letter and I'll, I'll send this to you. It was a newspaper article done in March of 1836. So it was after the Cooley massacre, but before the attack on Cape Florida Lighthouse. And although it doesn't name names of Lumlin, um, 
it does recount the same story of the an Indian named Alabama was killed, and that's why the attack happened uh, against Cooley. Why folks were against him. Now, um, the comment was also that Alabama was uh, at the Indian massacre at Fort Mims, which occurred back in August 30th, 1813, as part of the Red Stick War. Uh, and that occurred just north of Alabama. It was one of the worst Indian massacres at the time. Um, although I, I don't know that the Indians really considered it a massacre on their side, they lost 50 to 100 um, Native Americans. Um, and the fort, which was a palisaded uh, plantation, had about 250 militia, um, armed militia there, and another 250 civilians. And all of those folks were killed except for about 36 of them. Uh, so it was a certainly a one-sided defeat. It was um, heralded as one of the biggest Indian attacks or the biggest loss of life in an Indian attack up to that time. Um, but if the same chief Alabama, which might've been his nickname because he came from Alabama, um, he would have been quite elderly because the um, Fort Mims massacre occurred in 1830, 1813, and now we're in 1836. So it's a long um, timeline, but it's plausible. So mm -hmm. there's nothing that says that that's, um, that's not the case. And again, it was not only in Thompson's 1841 account, but also in this um, 1836 newspaper article had the same, same rumor. Okay. Now, everybody blames it on the Seminoles, um, but it was actually a creek that had come down from Alabama. Now, do you think it was the creek who actually attacked the lighthouse, or do you think it was the Seminoles, or do you think it was a combination? From the accounts that I've seen, I believe that it was a band of Calusa Indians, or they called them Spanish Indians at the time, um, who were remnants of the Calusa tribe from the west coast of Florida. They had associated themselves with the Spanish fishing rancheros, and their leader was, uh, I always mispronounce his name, Chacala. The reason we associated with that is because that's what the, um, he was often associated with any of the attacks in South Florida, including the Cooley Massacre, uh, the in, later Indian Key Massacre, and the um, Harney Massacre, in which Harney wasn't killed, that was up on the Caloosahatchee River by Fort Myers. Um, there were other attacks going on, but the Cooley Massacre was the first one in South Florida. Um, Cooley said that uh, one of the slaves that escaped that massacre knew a couple of the Indians. Um, Cooley's wife was a, uh, had been captured by the Indians and spoke their language, and Cooley had interacted with them a lot. So they, mm -hmm. they knew the local Indians and identified them as the ones that had taken place in the Cooley Massacre. 